thing. Hey, everybody. Tim from Alpha Wolf Trading coming at you with another CE, or well, no, executive interview from uh, Genius Brands International, ticker symbol GNUS. And this is a special one for me because, boy, I've been following this story for a long, long time. Uh, I am a shareholder. The size of that position varies, but um, I did just I, I did just add recently, <laughs> and uh, I have had a relationship with John Allweather for quite a while, actually, it's since you joined now. the firm, pretty much, right? Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you, John, for coming in and doing this interview. Um, I think Genius is is and you and I have had discussions about this before. I liked Genius a long time ago. I love Genius now, right? Because a lot has transpired and has put the company in a, a much different position than, than they were when you and I first started talking, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for having me and Tim. You know, it, it's mutual. And, uh, and I've really enjoyed our discussions over the years. And uh, one thing that I've enjoyed is uh, the frank talk. And uh, you've shared some good ideas over the years, and I think we've been able to incorporate some of them and uh, and some harsh criticism when it's deserved, too. And uh, and and so uh, no, I, I appreciate our relationship and and uh, and also uh, the platform that you invited me on today uh, with Alpha Wolf. Thank you. No, it's great. It's fantastic. And, and you know, I've watched I've watched what's transpired. And I, and I have to tell you, you know, Andy uh, and well. Some, you know, there are times when I haven't been the, the biggest fan of Andy. Uh, he pulled the rabbit out of a hat. I mean, he really, really did an amazing thing by putting you guys in the position that you're in today. I mean, we would I have thought four or five years ago that Genius would be closing and the acquisition of, wow, there was not a chance in hell I would have thought that was happening, right? <laughs> So we, I, I look at, at where, I mean, superhero kindergartens, Stanley universe, I mean, a lot of incredible things that have tremendous, I think, potential, right. Moving forward that have happened really in the last couple of years, right. Last maybe two, three years. It's yeah. really started a transformation and I don't like using transformational that much you know it's one of those buzzwords but there's been a transformational change in this company well it's pretty hard to say it's the same company today that it was three years ago or even two years ago um you know when you and i first uh, first met and first started speaking uh, about genius and some of our plans and some of our executives and some of the changes we were making um it was a teeny tiny company and uh it was it was around about 20 people in a room in Los Angeles. And, uh, and today you wouldn't recognize that company. You would recognize many of the same people. Uh, there, there's been a, a lot of great talent along the way that's helped us get to where we are. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is, I think it is transformational. You're right, it's a, it's a word that gets batted around a lot. But, um, but today's company, uh, post-close, if you're looking at the size of, of our human resources, just as a measure of the company and growth. Uh, today, we are uh, hundreds of people. We're over 600 people. And uh, that spans from development professionals, finance professionals, business affairs professionals, uh, an incredibly talented production team, um, everything uh, from concept to shelf. We have best in class professionals working on the team today and, and infusing new value. And so I think it's, it is really exciting to see and it's fun to see. And, and every day I wake up and I pinch myself because uh, I get to work for Genius Brands. Uh, you asked me earlier if I, if I ever sleep. It's not that much because we've got a lot going on. And, uh, and today we're a true global operation too. You know, often, uh, often I'll be on the phone in the mornings with uh, my colleague, Paul Robinson, who heads up our, our international business out of London. 
and then it might be a call to Toronto and uh, then New York and, and then the LA meetings start. And so uh, there's a lot of usable time zones on the clock and a lot of us make good use of those time zones. So I, you know, one thing I can say, and then we're going to talk about how you got, why you came to Genius, how you got the Genius. But one of the things I will say is that over the years, from the first time that I reached out to Genius, I have gotten calls from you on weekends. I have gotten calls from you uh, at night. I have gotten calls from you early morning. Yeah, and it didn't matter what day it was. So, you know, you're a very responsive. And I appreciate that. But it's a you know, big, big kudos to you because your work ethic is 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 fantastic. Right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm the one that you see the most often, but I'll say there's a lot of work ethic going around. And um, I often think about what, what are advantages that we have versus competitive forces in the market? Well, we have an incredibly passionate group of people who works at Genius Brands. Um, you know, I might just be like the tip of the iceberg. Um, we have I, I was here last night until uh, 9, 930 and there were still people left here. And um, and again, it's a, it's a 24 seven operation. We have 24 usable hours in every day and seven usable days in every week. And that's not to say that, uh, that nobody has a life at Genius. There are a lot of people with lives and families and passions. Um, but one of the advantages that we do have is being able to use those 24 hours an incredibly devoted, incredibly passionate staff. Everybody is here at Genius, myself included, because we want to be, because we believe in growth and because um, most of us are, are incentivized in, in a similar fashion to grow the company and to grow shareholder value. And so, uh, look, you, a lot of us could go and work for big corporations and be a small cog in a big machine. Uh, it's very satisfying to be uh, a, a force for growth and movement and uh, enhancement of shareholder value in a company of this size. And like you said, we, we, we are a different company today than we were three years ago. We're a different company today than we were two weeks ago. And in a year, in two years, in three years from now, I think uh, if you and I get to come back and have this conversation again, um, I hope you. Uh, I hope to make you fall off your seat, and uh, and I think we will. I really, uh, I really think that we've taken some incredible steps this year that that we'll talk about uh, further in the conversation. But uh, all right, uh, so I want you to know, real, I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm not the only guy. So, who so real quick, about. tell me, yeah. how, why genius? Why how, how do tell me a little bit about John and how John yeah. got here? Yeah. So um, I have kind of a unique background for Genius Brands. A lot of our, uh, a lot of my colleagues at Genius came up in the kids and family entertainment business, whether that's on the licensing side, the production side, uh, marketing. And uh, my background's a little bit different. I actually, when I was in college, Tim, I worked on boats. That's how I made money in college. And I became a sailboat captain. Uh, little, little by little, uh, became a sailboat captain. And thought, hey, this is pretty cool. This is a great way to see the world. And it wasn't my life's ambition, but it, it was something I was incredibly passionate about. And through that, I met a lot of great people, uh, a lot of people who were sort of, uh, if you will, captains of industry, uh, leaders in their space, whether that was uh, doctors and lawyers and dentists on Long Island Sound and uh, captains of finance on Long Island Sound or uh, cartoonists that I met on their sailboat in New England. And so through the sailing world, I, uh, I actually met Andy Hayward and um, Andy created Inspector Gadget, created so many of the cartoons that my generation and I grew up on. Just literally thousands of episodes, thousands of half hours of cartoons um, that Andy is responsible for the creation of uh, from concept, conjured out of thin air. And uh, he was also... Um, very savvy financially with his company Deke. And uh, he sold his company Deke to Cap Cities ABC, uh, went with Cap Cities ABC to the Walt Disney Company, operated the company inside of the Walt Disney Company for, uh, for quite some time, and, uh, and then saw an opportunity to maintain a good relationship with the Walt Disney Company, give them a first look, buy the assets back, take that company public. And then he also 
subsequently sold that company to a Canadian organization called Cookie Jar Entertainment, which was helmed at the time by a person named Michael Hirsch. And Michael Hirsch comes back to our story later in the story, but, um, but how did I get to where I am? So I met Andy Hayward through the sailing world, um, really loved his story, loved what he had done, looked up to him. And, and uh, as I kind of went off into, uh, into the workforce, I jumped into the startup world in New York City, and uh, I had worked for a, uh, a fashion company where I learned a lot about marketing and branding in a very entrepreneurial environment. That was a company called Vineyard Vines. And, uh, and Vineyard Vines today is not the company that you would recognize from uh, well, a decade and a half ago when I worked for them. And uh, that's, that's still privately held by the two brothers who founded the company, Shep and Ian. And, uh, and I got a master class from them in branding and marketing. Then I went into the ad tech space and actually sold uh, advertising to used car salespeople, Tim. And, uh, and I'll tell you, <clears throat> it, if you can do that, you can do anything. You can do anything, pretty much. Yeah. So if Vineyard Vines was a master class in branding and marketing, uh, working in the used automotive ad tech space was a master class in getting said no to, in getting kicked and getting back up. And, uh, and by the way, it was getting said no to with very creative language. Um, so, so I expanded my vocabulary in that business. Um, from there, I was really looking for the next thing. And, uh, and I'd learned a lot about uh, ad tech. I'd learned a lot about sales, about client management, about growing accounts, about really how to transact in business at a high level and how to connect uh, with partners and make meaningful relationships and maintain those relationships and grow those relationships for the benefit of the company. Um, after that, I was looking for the next thing. And uh, I, I, you and I talked uh, uh, biotech a little while ago. Uh, I was looking at two spaces. One was biotech. And uh, there was a lot of technology that really excited me in the space at the time and, and still today. And the other was, uh, was robotics. And uh, at the time, there were these things called drones, and nobody had heard of these things. I read this, this article in The Economist. This was the first time that I became aware of commercial drones, uh, or at least that I remember being aware of, of the potential for commercial drones. Um, was an article in The Economist that talked about these things called drones, which were flying robots that we think will do very useful things in the future. And... <laughs> But there's a lot of obstacles in the way between here and commercializing this technology. And I thought, okay, these are obstacles that, that are solvable obstacles. It, a lot of them were problems of getting more, uh, more tech onto a chip, onto a silicon chip, getting more transistors onto a chip, getting more computing process, uh, computer processing in the air and battery technology, both of which were, you know, uh, if you look at Moore's law, that's a very solvable problem. Uh, battery technology, uh, I have an old business partner who used to say, uh, if you solve the battery problem, you solve the world's problem. And, uh, and I still believe that to be true. Um, but uh, battery technology has gotten incrementally better and was getting in incrementally better at the time. And then there were regulatory issues and regulatory hurdles. And um, so I saw those as solvable problems and saw an opportunity for myself in that sector that I didn't see in biotech, which was really interesting to me. There were a lot of people who knew a lot of things about biotech, and I was not one of them. There were not <laughs> many people who knew anything about commercial drones. And I thought, well, this is something I can really learn a lot about. I can uh, reach out to the experts. They're not untouchable. They're uh, very accessible because it's not a big industry. I used to go to robotics conferences and, and there were no such thing as drone conferences. It was just autonomous robotics conferences where you would show up and it would be the, the car people and the, uh, the, the sort of uh, humanoid people and the drone people. And uh, so I helped grow, grow a couple drone businesses. And um, over the couple of years, we, uh, we operated our first company. It was the uh, first venture-backed drone service company in the U.S. Uh, still in operation today, has, has rebranded and refocused. Our, our thesis actually kind of proved out on that company. Um, it was initially called AeroCity, and it was one of the first FAA uh, exempt drone operators in the country, meaning it was illegal to fly drones commercially. Mm -hmm. And we had a hall pass. We had a special exception. Uh, very hard to get at the time. 
and uh, it became a, a, a moat around the business. And um, so we built this service business. Our hypothesis was there are a lot of organizations, there are a lot of governments that are going to want to use drone technology that's going to enhance their business, reduce their costs, reduce their risk, and, uh, and improve their data flow. But they're not going to know how to operate the drones. They're not going to know how to deploy them. They're not going to really know what they are at first and, and how they might help their business. And if we're an early entrant to that business and we learn boots on the ground, what are op operators' concerns, then we can actually develop scalable and valuable technology in the future. And so today that company has pivoted out of the service sector and is really in the software sector, creating valuable technology for, uh, for drone operations. So, so, you know, listen, you and I are going to have to, uh, we're going to have to off camera have finish. We're going to have to further this conversation. Uh, well, we will. And, and I'm still passionate about, you can probably see still passionate about this space and, and love it. And, um, and, and so there's a nice segue there. I, I worked at a couple different shops in the business and, and had great experiences. The, the, uh, the second uh, major shop that I worked for was what became the, the largest drone operator in the U.S. It was called at the time Measure. And I worked for uh, the CEO and the chairman of the board, a guy named Robert Wolf, who used to be the chairman of UBS Americas. And um, when I was hired by that company, they said, uh, why don't you come down to DC where the operations are based? And I said, well, I'm based in New York and I really like New York. And I think that it's a better place to build this business out of. So I, I think I'll stay here and I'll visit DC as often as you want. And so I would go down to DC to visit uh, part of the sales team, the marketing team, uh, to work with our CEO, Brandon DeClet, and our, our COO, Jesse Stepler. And, um, but I was based out of New York City with Robert Wolf, and we shared a very small office. And uh, Robert had an advisory firm, still has it. And, uh, and a family office based out of that location. And so uh, through Robert, I learned a lot about, the, uh, about public companies, a lot about investing, and, uh, and that was another master class for me and, uh, and, and really benefited from that tremendously. And Robert's still a friend and, and mentor and um, really, really has been a strong influence on my professional career and, and personal life. And um, really got to a point in that business where the, the part of the PL that I was running really didn't look like it was making sense for that company to continue with. That the part of the PL that I was running was actually media, arts, and entertainment. And so using drones to film large productions, small productions, uh, light shows, drone light shows. And so the segue here is that uh, the same technology, the same basic. 3D modeling technology that we use to make 3D drone light shows. So now you've probably seen QR codes in the sky and brands, and you know there there have been shows in Las Vegas over uh, over the fountain of the yep, Bellagio. Over Bellagio. Yep. And uh, so we use the same uh, animation technology and variants of the animation technology that we use today to create cartoons at Genius Brands. We use that to create art in the sky and uh, branding exercises in the sky. So um, that really, uh, through that period, I was speaking to Andy uh, sometimes once a week, sometimes once every other week, sometimes three times a week. And I would call him with a, a, a puzzle I was trying to solve at work. He would call me with a puzzle he was trying to solve at work. Uh, if I can put it this way, Andy was the experienced uh, leader who had seen a lot of the problems that I was facing. And I would describe the problem and he would say, oh, that's a number 87. I know that one. Here, here, <laughs> here are the things that you might want to consider. And, and here's how I would think about that problem. And, uh, and then he would say, uh, for example, I have a question about technology. He'd say, hey, there's this new thing called Instagram. And where is that going? <laughs> what's that going to be like? And what's that going to do? Or, um, John, have you heard of TikTok? It's taking off. And, um, and so we would just talk about what the future of entertainment would look like and what the future of arts and entertainment would look like. And we'd talk about capital strategy, investment strategy, growth strategy. And um, several times uh, over the years, and I, I wouldn't say several times, I would say often, Andy would always say, hey, um, looking to make a move? Or uh, if you're ever looking to make a move, let me know. And, uh, and I would always thank him. 
and uh, and kind of just say, hey, I've I've, I've got a I've got a job. I'm 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 very interested uh, in what you do, but I've got a job. I was also a shareholder at Genius Brands. I became a shareholder and uh, have never sold a share. So I, I was always fascinated by the company and and bet on the horse. You know, you you I backed the guy very early. I was a huge believer in Andy. He's continue to be, and he's always found value and created value. And, uh, and Tim, the last time he asked me, uh, hey, uh, this would be a great time if you would join the company. Here, here are the things that we have going on, and uh, here are the needs I have. And uh, I went home and I thought about it. I, I at first said no again, and I went home and I thought about it. Flew back to New York from LA. I was in town for business. Flew back to New York, and I said, wait a second. This is like getting a phone call from Picasso offering to teach you how to paint. And you said, no, doesn't seem like a good decision. <laughs> and so I kind of revised my position and called him back. And I said, Hey, are, are you serious about that? What do you have? What are the things that are going on at the company today? And I, I knew pretty well, but what did, what do you have in mind and, and where do you want to take this company? And uh, I was a young guy. I'm a young guy still, I hope. And, uh, and had um, a lot of things on my plate that were very exciting and a lot of interesting offers. And, uh, but this one really piqued my interest and I just couldn't, couldn't get it out of my mind and saw the potential and saw the opportunity. And again, uh, wanted to really take that masterclass from Picasso and let, uh, learn to paint from Picasso. And, and so I joined the company about three years ago. And um, again, it was a very different looking company when I joined, but there was a lot of potential. So what I find really fascinating about that background is this. I know for a fact, when you joined on to that company, <laughs> to this company, it was not fun. <laughs> I know it for a fact. There, there, were, there have been a lot of difficult times, right? And <laughs> if, there, if it was easy, everybody would do it. That's sort of the answer everybody says. If it, the bigger the puzzle to solve, the bigger the reward. And I do believe that. And, and we, we looked at a big puzzle in front of us at the time. Uh, we had a cap table that needed to be addressed. We had um, we really needed to capitalize the company sufficiently to to grow and compete in this market. And uh, the business model that that the company had worked on and had worked with for a few years, um, market forces were were sort of driving it down. And uh, you know that business model was really a production model uh, where we would produce content, we would place it on a network, we would be paid for that content, we would take a significant share of consumer products. And, uh, and when I say significant share, significant share, I mean licensing, but um, that share would get sort of got in the industry, not just with Genius, but in the industry, negotiated down by the networks over time. And they were moving more and more towards an in-house content model. So if you look at Nickelodeon, for example, Nickelodeon um, 10, 15 years ago would have taken a lot more outside product, a lot more outside content and uh, negotiated for probably less consumer products, licensing rev share. Um, and that has just climbed up over time. Uh, we identified an opportunity that, um, the opportunity was really the barriers to entry for becoming a distributor, a content distributor were coming down with technology. Those barriers were, were reducing over time. And the technology to distribute your content was no longer a barrier and a competitive advantage like it was in the cable business. Very hard to get a cable channel, relatively easy to get an OTT platform, an over-the-top platform. And today, I mean, you could have one for Alpha Wolf. Uh, I could give you the phone number for, uh, for the right guys, and you could have it by the end of the day if you want, uh, or have a deal by the end of the day. Um, and, and it's literally that easy. So today, the competitive advantage actually goes back to content and back to story and having the content that kids want to see. Um, so, uh, we've grown this. That, company. It, it, and that's a, that's a point that to really highlight, right? It's content. They say it all the time. Content is King, right? And it really is content is King. I mean, when you have something and it only takes one, uh, blockbuster to, to really 
puts you on the map, right? I mean, yeah. And and just thinking about that for a moment, like it, it's just a segue right into it. This is not scripted, everybody. This is like free flowing. So, you know, when you think about that, the the yeah. fact that one hit, one, you know, over the top show can literally make a company for years and years and years to come right and i'm just i just want to highlight this one <laughs> this one little thing here where is it uh the stan lee universe right i mean yes. how many hits did stan lee uh if i look at marvel enterprises and like see i think almost every movie they've done has been a billion dollar plus movie right when you, when you look at the value that the person stan lee he's a legend and he's a person he's a brand and a person that the person stan lee created value he created came out of his mind <laughs> it's in the billions and billions of dollars it's true it's really hard to understand that and i've spent a couple of years trying to wrap my mind around it and, uh, and, and he, he is truly one of the greatest creators, if not the greatest creator the world has ever seen. And uh, comic books are our, our, our modern mythology. They're, they're, they are religion for some, for some parts of our culture. And, um, and, and it's interesting because they they're the oldest stories. And it's carrying on a tradition that began around uh, campfires and then were painted on uh, rock walls of caves and then scribbled on papyrus and acted out in front of the campfire. And, and so storytelling has gotten better and there, there are sort of uh, parameters around it and, and, and there's an art and a science to storytelling. Um, but the storytelling hasn't changed too much. It's the, it's the technology that has changed and so great stories will always be the core of great entertainment. Great writing will always be the core of entertainment. What's really funny to me is, you know, I just read not too long ago, a bunch of, bunch of different actors and actresses that, you know, were kind of poo-pooing the whole superhero genre, right? And how a lot of those movies are just not even, they're not even acting. I mean, they're, they're, you know, just, uh, I, they keep thinking the genre is going to go away. And, and in my head, I think to myself, do I want to watch a really serious movie that you get some Academy award for that makes me want to cry at the end? Uh, because, you know, I mean, it was a true story or whatever. That's great and all, but you know what? Sometimes I just want to escape reality and watch a show about a superhero, right? And and just, I don't think a, a superhero is ever going to go. I don't think that genre ever dies because why? People want heroes. <laughs> it's you know? all part of a balanced diet, right? When you're when you're eating, you eat salad, you eat protein. And sometimes you let yourself have ice cream too. And that's, that's a real treat. And um, so I, I think that superheroes aren't just the ice cream uh, in, in that analogy. They can, they can be the spinach and broccoli too. Uh, because when, when you look at that genre, to your point, Tim, it, those are Greek and Roman gods in different skins and different clothing. And those are stories that have been, that, that have been told for millennia now. And they're being recrafted and retold and recontextualized in ways that make it relevant for today's audience and exciting. But, but these are stories that have resonated with human beings here, heart, and here, mind, for a long, long time now. So I, right. I, I agree with you. I don't think that genre is going anywhere. I think it'll change. It'll get refined. It'll grow in different directions. Um, but, uh, but audiences vote with their eyeballs and they vote with their pocketbook. And um, if you look at those movies, those are some of the top grossing movies. And Billions, TV right? Shows. I mean, I'm, I, how many characters did Stan Lee come up with? And look, I understand that Stan Lee, it wasn't all Stan Lee, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a whole team at Marvel that, and, and I believe you have one of those members on, 
uh, genius team. Um, but there was a whole team that made those movies successful, right? Success has many fathers, right? Many fathers and mothers. And, um, but yeah, those ideas, a lot of those characters originated from the mind of one or two people. And often it was Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, but they also had a small team that they worked with. And, uh, and look, I'm, I don't, I don't claim to be a creative. It's not, it's not who I am, but I have great respect for artists and great respect for creatives. And it, it is a true, it, it, I believe it's something that you're born with. I believe that, that creative minds work differently than other minds. And uh, one, one of our board members who used to work for Hanna-Barbera was sharing with me a story, uh, was it yesterday or two days ago, uh, about her work with, uh, with Joe Barbera. And she said, you know, he would draw a sketch of a character and you would see the show come alive in just that sketch. It was a show that had never existed before, but he would draw it on a piece of paper and he would say, okay, this is so-and-so now, uh, now go make the cartoon. And, you know, that's, uh, that's present in Andy and some of our other creatives on our team. You know, you mentioned, uh, we, we have a little bit of, uh, of comic royalty, of comic book royalty, of superhero royalty on our team, Michael Uslan. Um, Michael is the producer of every Batman film and really is the person who took Batman from bam, zap, pow. Fascinating wham. backstory on him too, because he bought the rights and then couldn't get anybody that wanted to do the movie, right? Yeah, and, 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 and for your audience, there's a lot of ways. If you Google Michael Uslan, you will find those videos and Michael has an incredible story and he's an incredibly passionate creative and entrepreneur. And I think that's what Michael Uslan has in common with Andy Hayward, with Michael Hirsch, with some of the rest of our team is left brain and right brain working together, not just seeing a great story, but seeing a great story and the business that surrounds that story. So plugging in, Okay, let's not just make a cartoon. Let's make a cartoon that has consumer products, that has licensing potential, uh, that has global potential. And so it's, it's not just about telling a story. It's about telling a story and fitting it into the context of a business and ensuring that you're building and harvesting as much value out of it as you can. Is, and I is, think it, with, is it uh, Margaret? Is it Margaret? Yeah, yeah, Margaret Lash. Yeah. That was at Marvel. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and Mar Margaret has an incredible story. Margaret, ma many people would say that Margaret is the most accomplished executive in the history of children's entertainment. She, she would not, um, but she's, she's a pretty humble person. But uh, Margaret built and sold Fox Kids from scratch. She uh, headed up Marvel Studios. You know, Margaret uh, tells a, an incredible story that, uh, that she was hired at Marvel. And then she was told, well, you're going to be Stan Lee's boss. <laughs> and she said, I, I can't be Stan's boss. And I said, sure you can. Everybody, everybody needs a boss. And, uh, and so she sat down with Stan and said, look, Stan, uh, I, I am really thrilled to be working with you, but I don't feel like I can necessarily be your boss, but uh, it's an honor. And I look forward to a great relationship. And, and I guess Stan turned to Margaret and said, Margaret, I have just one rule and we'll get along totally fine. And she said, oh, great. What, what's your rule? He said, never eat dessert off of my plate. And, uh, and I think that was the story. It might be slightly different. That, that one you could probably Google too. But, um, but uh, yeah, the, the pedigree and the talent at this company, Tim, is really, um, really incredible. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Andy earlier and his vision. Um, I think that's one of the greatest parts uh, uh, that uh, one of the greatest things that Andy has brought to the company is the ability to attract top talent, dedicated top talent that uh, that has, as he would put it, been to the promised land. So seen success, seen exits, seen large brands, built large brands, because there's nothing that you can replace experience with. And, and that's I, that, that talent continues to come. I mean, that's that's actually been uh, it seems like it's accelerated in the last year and a half. I, I, I agree with that. And and it has. Um, and uh, on the one hand, you could say, OK, uh, talent is expensive. On the other hand, I would say. How expensive is it to not have good talent? 
Um, I, I would argue that it's more costly to have employees that don't know what they're doing. And um, so, yes, it's an investment that we make and we analyze really carefully before we bring on uh, any hire, but especially a key hire. And if, if you look at some of the key hires we've made in, in the last year or so, um, I'll speak to our chief brand officer, Carrie Phelan. Carrie has uh, an incredible pedigree in the entertainment and consumer product space. And um, if you look at the people that Carrie has reported to, it mirrors very closely my biography shelf. Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, George Lucas, Steve Jobs. Um, and, and so Carrie is just uh, a tremendous, tremendous executive. And um, we had a very strong consumer products department and licensing department prior to Carrie joining the company. Um, Carrie has really taken that and, and ratcheted it up significantly. And, uh, and I think it was the right time for that as we, as we grow the company. Um, so needs, so, so we need to grow our, our talent pool. And Carrie has been a tremendous leader in that. Uh, Paul Robinson, who joined our cartoon channel team uh, when we announced our, uh, our, our strategic deal with YFE. We brought Paul Robinson in who had previously run the Disney channels worldwide. Um, Paul and I uh, get on like a house on fire as my, one of my Australian friends would say. Um, Paul and I clicked immediately and uh, Paul has experience in that business that I, that I really don't. He ran the Disney channels worldwide, built them and uh, grew them very successfully. And he's overseeing a lot of our international growth and expansion for Cartoon Channel. Um, we also recently brought on uh, someone named Todd Steinman to the Cartoon Channel team. Todd uh, has a background in entertainment since college. He, uh, he joined Warner as an intern at Warner Records and uh, had this particular interest in a thing called the internet, which nobody really knew about at the time. And they said, uh, well, you know about this internet thing. Why don't you start the internet department? And so Todd started the internet department at, uh, at Warner and, and grew that. And, uh, and through that, he, uh, he, he grew his network of contacts and, and expanded his network and, and realized that there was really a place for something called digital marketing. And he started one of the first uh, successful digital agencies called M80, M80, like the, uh, like the firework. And M80 uh, is a company that they grew and then subsequently sold to Martin Sorrell's WPP. And uh, it was part of the WPP family for years. He operated M80 and, and Group M inside of WPP for years. Um, so I, I think you're sensing a theme here. There's an entrepreneurial spirit there is a spirit of excellence. There is, you know, we talked about passion and vision. Um, and then another one of our team members who recently joined, uh, Cindy Kelly. And Cindy is based in New York where the ad, ad sales business is really based. And um, Cindy joined us uh, after, uh, after working for uh, Entertainment Studios with Byron Allen and reported to Byron and, um, has this particular passion and interest in the kids biz and has worked in the kids biz for a long time uh, prior to her work with entertainment studios prior to when, uh, when she helped, uh, helped do the deal with weather channel. Um, and so this is a bit of a homecoming to the, uh, to the kids business for Cindy. Uh, she worked at Ogilvy. She worked at cartoon network. Um, just a really, really tremendous, tremendously skilled operator. And uh, so again, if you're sensing a theme, there's a reason for it. We look for top talent. We look for talent that has passion and drive, uh, that knows how to, uh, not just how to play basketball, but how to play basketball and think at the same time, because the market is evolving. And so we want people who can see and spot those opportunities, hopefully before they arise, but certainly before anybody else sees them in our business. Right. All right, so Stanley, we got a hundred year uh, anniversary coming up. I I'm yes. anticipating that you guys better have some really big stuff to announce because if you don't, I'm gonna be real. You're gonna be getting one of those phone calls from me. <laughs> I thought you'd just go over my house this time. Um, and you're welcome too. It's only a few hour drive, but um, well, I well I can't speak to specifics of the plan. I know, 
I, I can know. tell you, and, and we, we've already shared this, I can tell you that we, we will be marking it and it, it is going to be a special event. And, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of our team, as we discussed, uh, knows Stan and knew Stan and worked very closely with him. You know, Andy, uh, in many ways, was Stan's protege. And, um, and he and Stan had a beautiful relationship. Uh, you know, I've, uh, Andy has shared with me some of their correspondence and, and I've had the pleasure to, uh, to meet Stan and spend some time with Stan before he passed. Um, and so it's not just, um, it's not just a business on this one. This is where the passion comes into. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we consider ourselves the custodians of his legacy. It's sort of a national treasure and a global treasure, uh, and uh, we we really want to be good custodians of his legacy. I, I want to emphasize something about Stan Lee real quickly. I, I think you know, as far as diversity and uh, things like that, he was. Um, I think he was light years ahead of where other other people were and are today i know i mean i there has not been a whole lot of specific detail on what was in stan lee's because explain to me real quickly or help me understand what exactly did genius acquire when they picked up stan lee's universe what what is that yeah so through a jv we we have the rights to stan's name image, likeness, and, and post-Marvel catalog of properties that Stan created. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been said that it's kind of like seeing some Beatles songs that were never released. Uh, you open a drawer and you see a, a bunch of pieces of paper, um, but, uh, but they're there and the stories are there and the ideas are there. And um, in an interesting way, it's, it's kind of like uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a mirror, not a perfect analogy, but a bit of a mirror to the Marvel story itself. Uh, you know, you probably remember years ago, Marvel was on the brink of bankruptcy. No, they, they went bankrupt. I well, yeah, they were, they went, bankrupt. <laughs> they, they, they went bankrupt. They were on the brink a few times. And, uh, and that was the story. Uh, you know, I have a friend who's an analyst who said you could set your watch by it. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there, there were times when, when the entertainment business, and it's hard to imagine today, uh, but there were times when Hollywood didn't see the value in Marvel or DC. And it's unimaginable today. It's unthinkable today. And even when the Walt Disney Company bought Marvel, uh, there were a lot of people who said in the business, oh, they overpaid. Looks like the deal of all deals. Hey, listen, what's so amazing to me and, and, the reason why I love genius and the reason why my very first, one of my very first stocks that I bought was Marvel mm -hmm. coming out of bankruptcy at a dollar a share. Yeah. Why did I do that? Well, <laughs> they came out with this movie called Spider-Man, which they didn't own the rights to it was Sony owned the rights to them. And, but it came out and I grew up, I, I grew up on comic books. I was a comic book geek and Spider-Man came out and I remember walking into Walmart and I walked into the cereal aisle and all I saw was Spider-Man <laughs> on just like every box, just about down the cereal aisle. And then I started walking around the whole damn Walmart, looking around lunch boxes, t-shirts, vitamins. I mean, it just was going on and on and on. And I'm thinking, these guys own the rights to all of the, and the movie was good. The, 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 the graphics and all that stuff was getting better, right? It wasn't so cheesy. And I'm thinking these guys are sitting on a gold mine because I grew up. So if I'm a dad, what am I going to do? I'm going to say to my son or daughter, look, I grew up on this. I love these guys. You know, let's go see this, right? They had a whole built-in fan base. And what are they going to do? They're going to create a whole nother fan base right below. Them. And I'm thinking these guys are printing money. They're literally printing money because as these movies come out, all they have to do is go out and open the mailbox and grab the royalty check and then go cash it. Right. That's the, so I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. And I bought the stock at a dollar. And I remember there was a certain show on CNBC 
where, you know, people would call in and ask, you know, what do you think of this stock? And you would either get a buy, buy, buy or sell, sell, sell. Every single time it was a sell, sell, sell on Marvel. Every single time. But it went from one to three to five to six. And that was during the dot com. I don't remember. If, I don't know if you remember, but dot com. I, I remember when I was a young guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the only stock that kept going, I was involved in a bunch of dot com stuff that I didn't even know what they did because my broker, that's where they had me. I wanted to sell everything and put it all in Marvel. And I got told that would be the dumbest thing I could ever do in my entire life, <laughs> which would have been the smartest thing I could have ever done in my entire life. But I didn't do it because he <laughs> talked me out of it. <laughs> and then two weeks later, the dot com, boom, burst. And, you know, so anyway, Marvel uh, continued to climb, right? That certain person on CNBC that kept saying sell, 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 sell the whole time because his th thesis was they've already used all their great characters. <laughs> They're run out of good. And I'm thinking to myself, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But what wound up happening, Disney buys them for $55 a share. You want to know what that certain person on CNBC said? loved the deal <laughs> wait a minute you didn't like the stock at three five ten fifteen disney buys them for 55 it's a brilliant move yeah how does that work man <laughs> but you know listen so i guess i don't want to get all stuck on stan lee but this is a big thing right that you guys have coming well, but we've got so much more but there's just not enough time to do it in an interview yeah it's I there's mean, a lot going on but you, you said something so really much. yeah you said something really interesting that i think is a uh, it's not a feature of this asset class that gets spoken about a lot but it's a really interesting draw an interesting characteristic of this of of this asset class that you know you said oh their characters quoting someone else their characters have been used they've all been used the interesting thing about this asset class, if you have a, uh, let's say an ag business, uh, when you sell an orange, it gets used once. When you sell an airline seat, it gets used or it doesn't, but you can't resell it you know, the, you know, from a broad perspective. It, it gets used or it doesn't. Um, when you license a character on a cartoon, it actually makes it more valuable, not less valuable. When your characters are popping up on lunch boxes, on juice boxes, in the classroom, on T-shirts, it's more valuable than it was yesterday. It's not just a revenue stream. It's actually advertising and helps sustain and grow. It's a virtuous feedback loop. Right. And that, and that, and you've got, so let's talk about real quick. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Rainbow Rangers, uh, I don't think that was his, and this is my opinion. I don't, I know, look, one thing I've always, Andy is, is Mr. Optimism. There's no doubt in, in, in my mind about that. Uh, he is Mr. Optimism. He's always, you know, uh, anticipating, you know, and I don't blame him for this. I mean, he's excited about things and he, you know, he has in his head where he thinks things are going to go. And sometimes I don't think Rainbow was as big of a success as maybe Andy had anticipated that it, it was going to be. Right. And that's a tough thing to swallow because you put a lot of time and effort into, you know, putting the thing together and yeah. hiring the people and doing all that. I don't think it was as as big as he had thought it was going to be. And that's Rainbow Rangers right behind you on the wall there. Right uh, here. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and then but then you have superhero kindergarten with yep. Arnie. I mean, mm -hmm. and who doesn't I mean, I don't think there's anything that Arnold's done that hasn't been something I like. Right. I mean, he's just the perfect character for superhero. And that's done extremely well. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and well, so to speak to Rainbow Rangers and actually to speak to, uh, to speak to sort of your comment about Andy, I think, look, that can be seen as maybe a negative, but also I see it as a positive. I don't want to work at a company where the leader doesn't believe in what we're doing. 
And, uh, and, and so optimism is important in leadership, being realistic in the company, uh, being realistic is very important also, but if you don't believe it's going to be a home run, why are you doing it? Right. You should put the brakes on today, whatever it is in any company. If you think that you're, that, that, that you are not deploying capital in the most efficient manner with a high percentage shot at returning a significant amount of capital to your shareholder base, then, then you should fold up. Then you should, you should think of something else to do with that cash. Um, but you know, today I'll tell you on Rainbow Rangers, we're putting season three out and season three has a fresh new look, has a lot of, uh, I, I actually think these are, these are stronger episodes than seasons one and two, which were strong. Uh, seasons one and two are on Netflix performing well. They're on Amazon performing well. They're on Cartoon Channel performing well. It has brand recognition. It has name recognition. And so I wouldn't count, I wouldn't say that Rainbow Rangers isn't a success. It's not, you know, the... Uh, I didn't say I didn't say it wasn't yeah. a success. I said okay. it wasn't as successful as I think Andy had anticipated it was going to be. And that could be, maybe I'm inaccurate in that statement, but I think that I think that's probably fair. I think we, you know, we we anticipated, uh, you know, it did, that it would be a different show. Now, one one thing about or 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 a different uh, a different outcome, you know, a bigger outcome, uh, but it is still a successful show. One one thing that that I think has changed for that program is that program was was in some ways when it was conceived, it was five years ago which when you talk about diversity and inclusion and thematic elements like uh, environmentalism, which gener Generation Alpha cares a great deal about, not Alpha Wolf, Generation Alpha, which is today's kids. Um, <laughs> they care about everything that is in Rainbow Rangers. If you, if you had a magic, if you had a crystal ball five years ago and tried to create a show for today, for today's that kids, would be it. That, that would be it. And right. so I give, and it's not so going away. Obviously yeah. you've got season three coming. Let's talk about the fact, and this is, look, you were reliant upon distributing it through the Netflixes and the Amazons. Yeah. What's changed today? Well, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> right. And, and, <laughs> and we still do distribute with those platforms and we see revenues from those platforms. Uh, but we also control our own destiny in a way with cartoon channel where we were able to say yes, we get behind this. We believe in this, and uh, and and this is one of our shows. And so we can really promote our own shows. We can help grow our own shows in a way that we couldn't necessarily do if we were beholden to somebody else. So your role has grown. So when you first came on, what what, what was your position? When I first came on, I, I forget what the title was, but it, it was it was really uh, business development, and it was taking a look at the company along with Andy, along with our CFO, Bob Denton, along with our COO, Mike Jaffa, and saying, how can we set this company up with an entrepreneurial mindset so that we grow it and expand it? And so that we grow our team with colleagues who have been there before to the promised land and uh, who have demonstrated a track record for excellence in this business. And, uh, and also then recapitalize the company grow our shareholder base um, and uh, and make sure that we're telling our story right and make sure that we're sharing. I mean, you you said a few minutes ago, there's too much to say in one interview. It sounds, when I share about genius brands with friends or family around the dinner table, it sounds ridiculous to say. It sounds like there's too much going on, like, there, like no one company could possibly have these good things all of these good things going on. Wait, you're telling me Stan Lee. Wait, you're telling me Cartoon Channel. You're talking about Kidiverse and Metaverse. You're talking about WOW and the productions that are being created at WOW. You're talking about your new head of consumer products, Carrie Phelan. You're talking about this, that, and the other thing. It's I, really, really amazing. I So, you know, it's funny. When you guys did the WOW thing, right, I, I didn't even know who WOW was, right? But as soon as I saw the announcement, what did I do? I went in and I went. I went and I went. Up, I went over and watched the Wow, uh, and I was like blown away yeah. by the mainframe studios and the graphics. I was just like blown away, right? I mean, yeah. I think there's a surfing penguin in here. It's really cool. 
Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's high quality, beautiful, stunning animation and top, top notch storytelling. Oh, unbelievable. I, I was blown away by and then I think the so there's the one so there's wow but then what's the other uh that's got like a billion views or or okay whatever. so there's there's wow there's mainframe studios that's a part of wow there's Frederator Studios it's a part of wow and Frederator Channel Network which is a, a part of a part of wow as well so these are sort of different uh, different revenue lines different business lines um wow and uh, sorry mainframe and Frederator Studios create content they're they're producing content frederator mcn frederator networks surfing yep. surfing pain. yeah there you go he's he's, he's cool <laughs> so, so frederator um not just creates content but it's it's also one of the original mcns or multi-channel networks on youtube and um I encourage any, anybody who's watching this who's not familiar with what an mcn is to uh to look it up just google youtube and mcn and um, really what it is, it's a collection of YouTube channels and creators that uses its scale to gain more scale. So it, it's using economies of scale on YouTube to gain more viewership, to cross promote products. Um, and so that's both a, uh, a business where we create content and where we also distribute content. Um, and uh, as you said, billions of views uh, billions with a B of views, which really adds to our story and adds to the, uh, our ability to monetize our audience as well. Right. So you've got the, you now have the platform, which you didn't have before. <laughs> you've got some really incredible brand brands that you are developing right now. And I'm not just talking about Stanley Universe, I'm talking about now you're gonna have Shaq's Garage. You've Love got Garage. which I it, think it, is it, gonna be stop, super... scroll, scroll back down for a minute there, if you will. Go to that little jet blue photo for me. Which what? There's a photo of a seat back uh that says jet blue on it. You, you just <laughs> oh, 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 oh jet blue up, up yeah. or down, up or down. Uh go up. It's up. a 50-50. Going up, there you go, right this there. One here? That's probably the best art in that whole newsletter. Um, the photographer is amazing. I have some of his work. Um, so, oh, so, you, you, took a, you took a picture of that on a flight, did you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, I think that speaks to another element. Um, I used to have a boss that would say, trouble makes trouble. And he, and he meant that in the sense of, when you're out in the market and you're making noise and you're making sales and you're creating something, the market hears that, people hear that. And of course, I'm talking about the B2B market, not, not the stock market. When you're out in the B2B market making noise, um, your competitors know about it, but your customers really know about it. And so uh, this deal that we did with JetBlue is, uh, is really exciting. And uh, I believe in sort of the hub and spokes model of product distribution of awareness. And when you think about airlines, that's a really critical hub for evangelists to gather and then disperse. So you get new fans on a flight and then they spread to the corners of the earth. And, uh, and that's actually something we talked about my background earlier. I learned that really well from the brothers who started Vineyard Vines, Shep and Ian, who, who started their retail business in a vacation location. In, in, in a resort location because they had, first of all, people, people come who were very in. happy. People <laughs> would come there from all around and then disperse. Right. No, that makes, that's, that makes incredible sense. Uh, and I probably have never thought of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I thought this was, I thought this little statistic up here too was pretty interesting. Uh, Cartoon Channel 4.9 rating over you know youtube kids disney cartoon right that's 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 impressive and uh and by the way you know there, there are people who pay as uh, from what i've heard who pay for reviews in app stores as far as i know and i would probably know we have never paid for a single review in the app store and um and so that that's really our audience and that that's a really special thing and so what is your uh, title now 
So my title now is, uh, what is it? Is it Executive Vice President of Business Development for Genius Brands and President of Cartoon Channel. And so I, I have a bit of a dual role. I, I, I really um, sit on the management team and am able to look at business development for the business at large. I focus most of my time on Cartoon Channel these days. There's a really huge opportunity there. We know it. Uh, we're on to something and, uh, and we're growing it. And, uh, and right now it's in a phase where it and it's not just, it's not just cartoons. Let's you've got K, What is it? KC pop quiz. KC pop quiz is a, is a great show. We have exclusive episodes that we're launching in the Kidiverse. You're on uh, the Kidiverse uh, image right now. So I'll speak to that for a minute. Um, on cartoon channel thus far, we've had an AVOD model advertising supported video on demand. So that means that kids and families come, they watch our programs, we insert advertising just like you would have ads running on cable TV or broadcast TV. They watch our shows, they watch the ads. We earn revenue off of those ads and that helps us grow the business. Now, today, you I don't know what SVODs you subscribe to, Tim, but I'll take a guess. SVOD is subscription-based video on demand. You probably have Netflix. I'm going to guess you have Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. Uh, maybe Showtime. Don't maybe forget HBO Prime. Max. Don't forget Prime. <laughs> Prime for the free delivery. Um, free. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of consumers out there who are paying a lot of money to subscription platforms. And, um, you know, I, as I thought about biz, building our business with our team, we really looked at different revenue models. And one of our important revenue models at Genius is licensed uh, consumer products. And so to have a powerful licensed consumer product show, you really have to have a lot of eyeballs. You have to have high awareness. And so, you know, you spoke to uh, Stanley's Superhero Kindergarten earlier. Uh, you said that that was a success. You know, that that's had tens and tens of millions of uh, views of this show. Uh, I think over 80 or, or maybe even 90 million views of the show. And that's expanding into international markets now. Yes, that's correct. And um, and by the way, Arnold is just as powerful in international markets uh, as he as he is in domestic ones. And uh, and his name really carries tremendous global weight with it, too. Um, so. Uh, it was important for us to launch a platform that could launch consumer product shows and have that exposure in those eyeballs. We've also seen and identified a market opportunity behind subscription-based video on demand services. Uh, the pandemic has certainly fostered that growth in a lot of families. A lot of families have changed their budget around. They weren't necessarily going out for entertainment as much or eating out as much but they were cooped up at home and now they're very used to paying subscriptions for content. We very intentionally priced our offering, uh, we think pretty well for the market. And uh, if I could speak to you, um, well, I'm an expecting father. We're expecting our first kid, my wife and I in October. And so I'll speak to you as an expectant father. Um, for the price of a cup of coffee, for $3.99 US, a Starbucks coffee, um, you can, you can give your kid good entertainment, positive values, entertainment for a month with no commercials, with all sorts of extra features and benefits, um, like digital trading cards, That's $3.99 and 99 cents for a month, not for one like month. Yeah. And we, we month. also will offer other packages with discounts. What's great about that from a shareholder perspective, and, and now I'm taking my, my expectant dad hat off and putting my shareholder hat on, is I look at that and I say, okay, well, previously you had a model where you were going to advertisers and you were working with them programmatically, or you were working with them directly and, and doing direct deals, but that can be a lumpy market. And it's also pretty heavy Q4. So even if it's, if it's not, you know, if it's steady through the rest of the year, Q4 is always going to be your biggest quarter. And uh, there's probably more value that you can take out of that business and probably more predictability that you can infuse around that revenue. Now, I told you earlier that I had a, a tech background. I, I'm really familiar and really comfortable with SaaS businesses, with software as a service businesses mm -hmm. and, and other types of subscription. Which happens to be my favorite business model, by the way, just so you know. Because it's usually very high margins and 
also very predictable. And, and so that's what I really wanted to infuse and what our team wanted to infuse around cartoon channel revenue is high growth, high predictability. And um, that's what we think we have with this subscription model that we're launching. Today is Wednesday, April 13th. We're launching it on Friday, April 15th. And, uh, and so, um, you know, your, your timing is impeccable. And now is, is um, that, does that include the Kitiverse? I and mean, so that's, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So what is the Kitiverse? So yeah, what is the Kitiverse? Panel, if, if I can describe it very simply, and, and there's going to be small exceptions to the rule, but um, I think you know that we have an offering on Pluto, and that's a linear offering. I think you know that we, uh, you probably saw that we have now an offering on Roku channel, which is a linear offering. Um, we have channels globally through our YFE deal. Uh, which are linear offerings. If I can break it down very simply for you, Cartoon Channel is those linear offerings and those other platform offerings that help us expose our individual IPs like Superhero Kindergarten and Rainbow Rangers and help us grow our brand, our Cartoon Channel brand, uh, and expose it to more, uh, more audience and a bigger audience around the globe. So that's the cartoon channel side of the business is really linear and free content on ours and other platforms. And then the Kidiverse is really the, I, I would call it an SVOD plus product. It is a subscription-based video on demand plus product. And what's the plus you might ask? Well, of course, we're going to have exclusive content, uh, a ma actually a massive catalog. It's, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest kids entertainment catalog that's out there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have some of our, our brands in that newsletter that, that you have up on the screen, but, um, some of our licensed content includes shows like Peppa Pig and PJ masks. Uh, another, another one that I like these days is Ricky zoom. Another one I like is super simple songs, which is there. Those are songs, short snippets for toddlers. And, uh, and so what, what you would call behind the paywall, this is industry speak. So there's the free side of the platform and then the paid side, the subscriber side. On the subscriber side, you'll have exclusive content, exclusive shows. You'll have a great volume of content that you can select. You'll have deeper catalog that you can select as a viewer. You know, we spoke earlier about this, content is king. Um, and then this is really what we're launching on Friday is the first step, the first phase of a rollout of metaversal features. So things like digital trading cards will have, avatars will have, um, VR and 3D content, immersive content. And um, of course, it's all geared towards kids and families' special needs. We have a special audience. We have to protect that audience. And um, so kids emulate the behavior of grownups. So if you're a kid and you see a grown-up, you know, opening their crypto wallet and looking at their various NFTs, well, gee, you might want to emulate that behavior, but you probably don't have enough cash to buy a crypto pump or, uh, you know, or insert, uh, insert name here. We want to provide a safe learning environment for kids, and we're going to with the Kidiverse to see that behavior and learn positive values and positive habits around it. You know what is so cool? I mean, I'm digital currency for kids, kid bucks, kid of bucks. So, you know, what's, what's really interesting to me is I have thought out that our, our education system is broken forever, right? Yeah. What, did you get it taught to, uh, about how to invest in stocks or how capital markets work or any of that stuff when you were growing up in school? Because I sure as heck didn't. I've, I'm older than you, though. Not, not, not in school. I'll tell you, I read a lot. I read a whole heck of a lot, but didn't didn't learn about but, it. But then you didn't you didn't, didn't get taught the practical things that you need in life when you were how, in how to pay your taxes, why you pay your taxes, yeah, uh, stuff like that. Difference between a stock and a bond. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. By the no. way, do you guys have you guys have? Uh, there's this one guy. What's his name? Warren Warren uh, Buffett. <laughs> Yeah, that guy right there. So, so of course, I, I have my Warren, Warren Buffett doll um, that is based on the show that we do called Warren Buffett's Secret Millionaires Club. And so you know this, Tim, but, but maybe your audience doesn't. Um, Genius Brands, everything that we do 
has to be what we call content with a purpose. That's one, that's one of our competitive differentiators. It's something that the market is starved for and looking for. It's something that we get mail about and comments on social media every single week about is my kid watches X and learns values that I don't want them to learn when they're watching X. Maybe there's too many commercials or bad commercials. Maybe it's violence, negative language, uh, reinforcing negative stereotypes. We want to be that place that parents are very proud and very happy to put their kids in front of the TV. You know, um, I I use this analogy a lot. Uh, Every parent knows that they're supposed to feed their kid really nutritious meals, um, but a lot of kids, it's hard to get them to eat broccoli. (laughs) <laughs> if you sprinkle a little bit of cheese on top of it and melt that cheese, boy, is that broccoli a whole lot more fun and a whole lot more palatable. Um, and so I like to think that that Cartoon Channel is a mixed nutritious offering. We have exciting programs that maybe skew a little bit more uh, action and excitement, sort of like the Marvel stuff that you talked about before, like Uh, Stan Lee's superhero kindergarten. And we have more sort of direct instructive content that's still fun, but it's more educational, like uh, Warren Buffett's Secret Millionaires Club, which isn't how to read a balance sheet. These are really core and fundamental business lessons taught by and, uh, and, uh, and, and sort of crafted by Warren himself, like location, location, location. These are Simple. Although I think you'd have a hard time getting Warren Buffett or um, his partner to talk about Bitcoin or Metaverse or any of that stuff. I think, well, I they, think they talk be- about it these days. <laughs> they, they talk about it. Um, but look, as a technologist and and as a, as somebody who's interested in markets, um, my view is probably going to be different than than Warren or Charlie's. But. Uh, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say it's better. They they know a lot, a whole lot more than I'll ever learn. They've forgotten. But you um, are you are definitely passionate about the crypto space. I am very, uh, and that that's personally and for our business as well. And I think, um, look again as a technologist, I I often really push on people and and try and challenge them to why is this useful? What's, why is this going to be in business uh, or a part of the business landscape, not just two years from now, not two weeks from now, 10 years from now. And I look at blockchain uh, and I look at, I look at NFTs as, as, as smart contract technology. Um, I have a lot of friends or, or a handful of friends, I should say, who, who work at the very top of the art market, the, the international art market. They're fine artists And um, so this conversation has really been brewing with them. And and I I found it a really engaging intellectual dialogue of uh, learning uh, and hearing their thoughts on what is art, what is technology, what is selling out or not selling out. Um, To me, the technology, it keeps coming back to the technology is a smart contract, is a way to track a purchase and ownership. And uh, I think you're gonna see tickets at sports games and uh, airline tickets become non-fungible tokens. I, I think you know today, a lot of the country and the world that's thinking about NFTs is thinking about non-fungible tokens as a JPEG, a PFP, a picture from profile. And there's uh-huh. so much more that, there's so much more potential there yeah, I mean, I think there's what three point six billion dollars in fraud in art and collectibles, antiques, and even that, comic that, books. That, that, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Attach a, an NFT to a physical object to for an insurance company. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that we haven't even started to scrape the surface on, as far as I'm concerned. And, and it's not a perfect analogy, but I think of NFTs a lot like I think about barcodes. Nobody thinks a barcode is very exciting today. It's just on the back of every object that we buy in a supermarket. Um, but it was incredible technology for its time. And it en- enabled better inventory tracking, uh, better purchase and sales tracking, um, better inventory management for a lot, of, a lot of large firms and small. And today it's not something we think about. Uh, it's just there. And um, I think that NFTs are going to become maybe not a perfect analogy, but that's going to be a technology that enables business, that enables commerce, and isn't necessarily a buzzword on its own. Just like today, barcode is not a buzzword on its own. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. So 
VR goggles? Do they get some VR goggles, really? So, so we're going to have <laughs> immersive content. And this is where it's really important. You know, there's a lot of nuance in the kids' business. And you, that's why, one of the reasons why it's really important. Again, I, my background, my, my early training was not in the kids' business. And so I benefited from learning from uh, a lot of our colleagues some of the nuance of the kids' business. If you look at various um, VR headsets, you know, probably when, when a lot of your audience thinks about a VR headset, they're probably going to think Oculus. It was a huge Christmas for Oculus, uh, holiday season for Oculus. Obviously, Meta, the artist formerly known as Facebook, is really getting behind Oculus and the metaverse. Um, if you look at Oculus, I think it's uh, the recommendation is it's limited to like 11 plus, 12 plus, or 13 plus. Some of the other technologies are, are, are likewise older than our audience. Again, kids look up. Kids look to grownups to emulate that behavior, and they're they're going to want that be, that that experience. And so, really, we're thinking about this a little bit differently than perhaps some of the rest of the market is. Um, I don't think that there's a lot of parents of young kids who are going to want their kids wearing immer fully immersive VR goggles, wandering around the living room, bumping into things and injuring themselves. I could be wrong on that. No, I think I'm you're right. I'm pretty sure that, <laughs> that that's the case. And, and, you know, again, we have a really special audience. We're not going to do anything that puts our audience in harm's way, whether it's uh, a, an outcome that could be like that or even developmentally. Um, virtual reality technology is really, really powerful. And, uh, and we don't know yet how that affects young minds. Right. It has the, op it has the ability to unlock, truly unlock new worlds and new understandings. Um, but I think the idea of putting kids in an immersive environment for any period of time is not a great idea. Not at this point. I think we need more science behind it and uh, more research behind it. That being said, we're working with scientists right now and educators to understand how we can do this safely, right? We have somebody on our, on our team, Don Roberts, who really wrote the book on entertainment and, um, and early childhood. We work with, we, we also have members of our board, members of our company who are steeped in child psychology and education. And so the way that we're looking at this is really a simple starter experience for young kids to understand or kids to understand after a certain age, what that immersive environment looks like. If you're familiar with Google Cardboard though, uh, that's where you put your cell phone into a, the back of a cardboard box more or less and uh, hold the cardboard up to your face and you can look in. It's kind of <laughs> like a magic window on the world. And that's something that I think can be really exciting and instructive and educational for kids so that they can see what it's like to be on the floor of a, of a rainforest or at the top of Mount Everest or on a coral reef and understand the world around them in a new context. I think that's really special and educational. I think it's got to be done in the right way. It's got to be limited to certain ages and developmental stages. And I think there have to be time limits and other intelligent limits that are based in research put around it for the safety and, uh, and uh, protection of our audience. But yeah, I think it's a really exciting thing. All right, listen, I, I, we've gone through, uh, uh, I've tried to get as much as I can get in. And I know we're running out of time here. Shaq's Garage is coming up soon, right? I so think it it's going to be, I think it's going to be the bomb. You got the Gronk in there. I mean, come on, man. The Gronk, really? Gronk Ready? is the Gronk is the man, and Gronk has a great team, and 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 uh, they've been super supportive of the show. Um, and uh, look, Rob is an incredible athlete, and he's an incredible entertainer. I I actually just saw him hosting an award show uh, over the weekend, and and he killed it. And he uh, he's got this. He's got a great sense of humor. He's got this magnetic personality. He's got a <laughs> self-deprecating sense of humor. He he's easy to laugh. Um, you know, and, and I think that translates really well to our audience. And, uh, and then when you pair him with Shaquille and of course, Robin, Robin Shaq know each other in, in real life, but when you pair him with Shaquille, uh, you have two athletes and entertainers who are really at the top of their field. Again, theme of high performers, top of their field. Um, yeah. they infuse tremendous pre, you know, pre-existing brand equity into that Shaq's garage brand. You know, why, why should I care? 
as a uh, as an industry stakeholder about Shaq's Garage. If I'm outside of Genius Brands and and I'm being sold by Genius Brands, oh, I should care because those are huge names. And and frankly, a lot of what Shaq ch- touches today turns to gold. And uh, he he is one of the most successful pitchmen out there. He's one of the most successful licensors out there. And uh, and he's really 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 he's not just having a moment. He's having a, a decade or a couple of decades. And and we think that Rob is coming into that. Gronk is coming into that uh, himself. And uh, uh, and they bring new energy and different energy to the show. All right. So listen, I don't want everybody to think just that I'm just a uh, cheerleader. Right. I want you to be just a cheerleader. So, so we're going to have to talk about real quickly yeah. some, some, some tough stuff. Right. Please. So this, this is the genius chart, uh, which I was not a fundamental guy. I was not a chart guy. I was a fundamental guy. I've always been a fundamental guy. I will always be a fundamental guy. But then I took a charting course 15 years ago. And, that, and now the first thing I look at is a chart. <laughs> right. Yep. And, Let's face facts. The chart is not pretty, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you've been in this, it's been a painful ride. And there are some things that, it, even though Andy pulled the rabbit out of the hat and has placed the company in a much better position than they were in, there are still some things that are concerning. For example, uh, the amount of shares outstanding, fully diluted, is not exactly a small share count, right? Mm-hmm. I think what it were you're at about four. Is it, it's almost a half a billion shares, right? Right, round numbers. Yeah, round numbers, half a billion shares. Okay, that's that is tough to swallow because it means you're going to have to do an awful lot of revenues in order to make shareholders any kind of money in the long. It, right, I mean anything significant. Yeah. So, and even at these levels where it does look very cheap at 85 cents, that's really not that cheap when you figure out the share count, right? So <clears throat> the question is, does Genius have the abilities to grow into that share count? Yeah. Right? So let me, let me step back to a big vision perspective. Okay. Genius is not in this to be a micro cap company forever, to be a boutique or small uh, insert any diminutive language here. Uh, we have big aspirations. And going back to the beginning of this conversation, Tim, you said, you know, two, three years ago, wouldn't have ever imagined that you would be here today. And I, and I suggested that you probably won't ever imagine where we're going to be in two or three years from now. And uh, so we have big aspirations. We have big ambitions. And I think we know how to get there. Um, that's not to say um, that I, I don't, understand what you're saying about the chart right now. Um, look, I told you earlier, I'm a shareholder. And so I can, I can certainly put myself, and I started at Genius as a shareholder. I was a shareholder before I was, I was on the team. And, and, and to be fair, Andy hasn't been shy about buying in the open market either. No, and a- Andy has uh, participated in financings. He's bought in the open market. Andy has bought and bought and bought time and time again, and uh, he's been a great supporter. And and um, you know, it's there are some shareholders who for whom it's it's never going to be enough. Um, and I can understand that. I can I can put myself in their shoes, but I also. Um, look around and look at the market and look at other companies. And there are very few CEOs who have supported their company in such a big way so many times, time and time again, at different share prices, at different levels, and whose, whose future is so tied to the share price, whose incentives are so aligned with their shareholder base. And so I look at that as a positive. Um, I look at that as a big positive. And in fact, it's something that I look for in companies that I invest in is, is management well aligned with the future of the company. And I, I think that unquestionably, yes. Um, so no, nobody, is, nobody is at genius to be status quo and static. You know, you talked earlier about one property can change the face of a company. And that happens time and time and time again in our business, not just the kids' business, but I'll, I'll use a couple examples in the grown-up entertainment world that your viewers might be more familiar with. Netflix, House of Cards, HBO, Sopranos. Uh, in the kids' business, 
every network has risen on a hit. But so I'll use Showtime is uh, billionaires, right? Showtime, billions. And now HBO is seeing a lot of wind in its sails with succession. And so, um, you know, these properties, these IPs change the face of a company very rapidly when it happens. And genius brand strategy is, look, if you, if you could make a hit, Every studio in the world would be doing it if there was a formula. It's kind of it's kind of like building a portfolio of stocks and bonds. Um, you need to have company. Uh, well, for us, it's building a portfolio of properties that are non-cannibalizing, so they're not competitive with each other. They're not fighting out in the open market with each other. That fill different niches of the market. So maybe that's a different psychographic uh, audience or demographic audience. Uh, you know, the easiest way to look at it is we've got shows for young kids, shows for preschool kids, shows for bigger kids, um, and so building a portfolio thoughtfully and strategically is very important. And, uh, and, and when you have the fundamentals that are in place, just like a stock, it might not take off right away. Um, but if you have enough shots on goal, then you're probably going to pick one that's a 10 bagger, uh, and, uh, that might make up for years of portfolio. All right, and real so, quick. It's not I, without I, thought though. I, I want to highlight that. It's very strategically done. I got it. So listen, the, and I'm sure that this, especially for retail investors, this is probably one of their big concerns. The fact that you're back below a dollar and being on, listed on the NASDAQ, right? You get the letter that says you got 180 days to get your Price over a dollar, I think it's for, what, what is that, for 30 days straight? It, that, it, I can't remember what it is. Oh, is that 10 yeah, days? I have to get back to you on the specifics. I think it's less than 30. but It uh, might be 10 days straight, yeah. right? Um, and then you don't have to worry about it. But then if you stay over there, I think it's if you stay under for 30 days, that's when you get the letter. If you stay up above for 10, then you're off, right? I, I think I think you're right. It's, so it's everybody, so I'm sure that, Everybody's concerned that there's going to be a reverse split or something to correct this particular dilemma that the stock is sitting in, right? And I doubt that you can say anything as to whether or not you're going to do a reverse split. Um, but I think Andy has indicated in the, in the past that he has no intention of doing a, a reverse split. I, I mean, I don't know. Things change, right? So... Th things change, but what I what I can tell you right now, Tim, with a hundred percent certainty, is I have not heard any conversation about that, and okay. so that's what I can say right now. Um, now, yeah, things change, but I, I and with the business that we have going on right now, I anticipate and and several uh, developments that that we're working on at the company um, that are not yet ready to share with with the public. I anticipate that there are some events that are coming up that, that will sort of change that. And I also think we're, we're stuck in a really tough market right now. It's not just Genius Brands that's suffering here. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, there's no question we have a gravitational pull down of a tough market. Um, markets change, situations change. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, what, what we like to say, control your controllables. What can we control? Well we can control at least partially the world that we create inside of our industry. We can create new deals, create new value. We're focusing on the things that we can affect change on, not necessarily, we're, we can't exert influence on the macro economy, um, but we can go and do some transformative deals in our own world. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say that because here's the deal. Uh, one of the things that genius used to have to deal with was just the fact that you didn't have cash. You didn't have a, you've got a very solid uh, amount of cash in the bank. <laughs> so right. that is one thing that you guys do not have to focus on anymore is where is the next, you know, money coming in to pay our bills. So that is, and I think that I would say that's probably a big weight off of your shoulders, right? <laughs> It, it is. Um, if I had time to sleep at night, I, I, I would be able to. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I, look, I, when I look at companies to invest in, I look at, do they have the cash to get to where they need to go? 
And that's, that's one of my most fundamental questions. And so I think you're right in addressing that, that two, three years ago, Genius Brands had a, a difficult time. It was, it, it was in terms of financing our production, financing our company. It was, we didn't have necessarily the cash to do what we needed to do. Um, but we had a vision and we were able to share that vision and make that vision a reality step by step. And we're still building that reality. And but it's almost a perfect storm for you because, as you indicated, this is not a genius only story. This is not a fundamental yeah. story. This is a small cap, micro cap has been getting pounded for 12 months. For months <laughs> and I don't care. Yeah. I don't care who you are or yeah. what company it is. Uh, if you're in the small cap, micro cap space, it hasn't been a fun 12 months, right? Yeah. It's, it's been a very difficult time. I mean, as an investor, I, I uh, okay, I default back to Warren Buffett. When what Warren says, and this is in our show, when the market is afraid, be bullish. When the market's bullish, be afraid. And um, so I, I think there are, as I look out as an investor, I think there are tremendous deals right now in the market. I think that shareholder, that investors in the market need to be really aware of what the risks are, like always. Um, cannot stress that enough. And I think that there's been a lot of a lot of investors who have come into the market in the last couple of years, and that's fantastic. Um, we we want that, but you you really can't do enough research on a company. And research, I don't think, ever ends on a company. It's ongoing. It's continuous. And uh, I can tell you through the genius lens of how quickly things change and new developments happen, new deals get cut. Um, we, we move this environment, So let's, why is this the perfect storm? Why do I think this is the perfect storm for Gene? Yeah. You got a, you got a bulletproof uh, balance sheet right now. Yep. And you have a market that's been getting pounded for 12 months. So companies that may have thought that they deserve this crazy ass multiple 12 months ago, <laughs> maybe looking at things a little bit differently now, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some opportunities that really couldn't have been had or would have been dumb to pay up for right. over here. But now they're starting to become maybe logical, right? Because they're, they're actually coming back to earth. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you're speaking to sort of like a, a, if you will, right sizing of value on certain companies. Um, you know, one thing that, that's interesting to me right now is we, we just announced uh, the closing of our, our acquisition of WOW. And that, that acquisition has totally changed the face of Genius Brands positively. Uh, it comes with significant revenues, comes with contracts that are booked out for years. So predictability of revenue in, in a company that, frankly, has had lumpy revenue, ours in, in the past. Um, we're talking about, you know, you and I spoke about the predictability of recurring revenue in uh, a SaaS model, but we're, we're talking about subscriptions here at Genius Brands. So what are we doing? We're, we're not just shoring up our balance sheet. We're not just growing our, our strategic value in our own business, in our own industry. We're also putting predictable revenue on the balance sheet, predictable earnings on the balance sheet, and then layering in sort of that strategic upside on top of it. And so as I look at, as I look at the market right now, I don't think the market has, had, my personal view, I don't think the market has well priced in these acquisitions that we've done. I, you I would think? Like your thoughts on it. Um, but uh, listen, but yeah. I'm not going to tell anybody to buy or sell a stock because that's not what I do. I'm not a financial analyst, but I can say this. And I can say this with conviction. I know that this company today is a hundred times stronger than the genius that I have known for the last five years. Okay. Yeah. And if anything, fundamentally, this story has gotten almost scary good. And the moves that have been made over the last year, two years have been phenomenal. Yeah. And I think the, <laughs> the company is positioned for, I mean, look, what's your downside risk here? I, I, everything I look at is a, on a risk reward right. basis. And so, okay, it's at 85 cents. The worst that can happen is it goes to zero. Do I think that you have a shot of going to zero 
with a hundred million dollars in the bank? Probably not. <laughs> I think you. I, I, I'm gonna, survival... I'm gonna, I know I'm a biased party, but I'm going to agree <laughs> really, really hard with your take on that. I would think the odds are you're probably going to survive. Um, and I think that this, if you look of all times for genius, for me, this would be a really, I think, an opportune time to take advantage of a depressed stock that has turned, the, I said transformational earlier. I don't like using the word, but I truly believe this company has transformed. And I think there's going to be some amazing things between the Stanley and the Shacks and the Kidiverse and all this stuff that's happening. The best, best days are yet to come. We haven't even gotten there yet. I, I agree with that statement is like we're, we, Oh, you you said that we've grown tremendously, that we've transformed the company. I, I kind of feel every single day like we're just getting started. And, uh, and we have this vision. We know where we're going. We know how to get there. We know what we need to do. And, uh, and we're really executing against it every single day. And, um, and, and in this business, in every business, business is people. And we have the best people in the business that we're working with, that we've brought to the team, that we've been able to attract top talent. And, uh, and that's no accident. And success that those operators have had in their businesses in the past is no accident. And um, so we, we think we've got a really good team. We think we've got really good fundamentals. You spoke to our balance sheet. We have a very strong balance sheet today. We have businesses that have bookings out for half a decade in terms of uh, solid work, solid workflow. We're building recurring revenue businesses and we're building brands that we think have mega hit potential like Shaq. And, and you're on the cutting edge of what, where everything is going, right? I mean, you are, and you're, but you're not just out there. You're not just putting out a press release. Hey, yeah, we're going to do an NFT division like some companies do without a plan, right? It's just like, oh, we're just going to do that because everybody's yeah, If we, if we wanted board. to put that buzzy sort of a press release out around NFTs, we would have done it a long, long time ago. You know, there are those of us at the company, there's a, a solid core of us who have been looking at this technology for a long, long time. Um, we're really well connected in that world. And, uh, you know, you and, I, you and I talked about it some time ago that um, there, there was a mania, there was a hype and, uh, Putting something out there without having a plan is the absolute wrong way to go. Um, and we do have very special brands that we want to foster the growth of, not diminish the value in. And, uh, and we have a special audience that we're responsible to in kids and their parents. And uh, so, so going out without a thoughtful plan around that was not an option for us. So listen, John. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I, I know I've taken a lot of your time, uh, but, you know, listen, I, I, I think, like I said, this is a this is a great opportunity. Maybe you don't want to buy the stock, but I would suggest putting it on your damn radar. Right. I mean, put it on your radar because I think great things are are just around the corner. And not that great things haven't already happened. They just haven't been reflected in the stock price yet. But the, I do believe that at some time, at some point, it's going to reflect. I mean, it's, it will happen. I, you know, patience is a, in, in the investing world, it always seems that it takes longer than you anticipate, but it will eventually happen, I believe. And I believe it will happen in this case. So um, I, I appreciate you taking the time, John. I, you know, I know once you get this, you know, wow is closed now, right? So that's going to be a, that's going to play a dramatic role in your next quarter, I would think. Yes. Um, yeah. But after after this, you kind of dust settles and the kid versus, you know, the subscription thing is kicked off. That's what, two days? Start, starting in just two days. And uh, and that's going to be incredibly exciting. And um, look, we uh, to go back to your point earlier about patience in the market, because we make Warren Buffett's Secret Millionaires Club, a few of us are are really just like uh, Warren aficionados on his sayings. And um, he has a great one, maybe a closing thought, but, uh, but one of his sayings is that the market is a mechanism to transfer money from the impatient to the patient. And as, as a corollary to that, I, I would say, act with, impa with impatience 
when you're operating a company and, and I think about acting with patients in my own investing. And so we operate super aggressively. We operate on, uh, uh, on tight timelines and, and execute against type, tight timelines because we know that time is money and, uh, and we treat our shareholders' money as if it's our own, uh, in, in more, more sacred, in fact. So um, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. No, this, was, this, was, this was absolutely awesome. I'm going to stop the recording unless you feel as though I missed something. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, there, there's tons that we missed that we didn't touch on, like you said, but uh, we can always come back. We just don't have enough time. I mean, we don't have enough like, time, and probably we've lost half of our audience anyway. They're 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 uh, they're on Cartoon Channel now. No, because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to I'm going to cut this in two. Hold on a second. I'm going to I'm going to stop recording here. Before you do, Tim, I would say if you can put our IR address on, uh, you know, a little uh, indicator of our IR address, email address. Yeah. In case, any of, in case any of your followers have questions, they can reach out. Um, we do try to respond to every single message that we get. To so that you guys lot. also have you also have uh, email alerts as well. Right. So anytime you put out a press release or an SEC yeah. filing or any of that. You yeah, so have that sent that, directly that's right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get you that link so that your followers can click on the link uh, below and or on screen. And uh, you know, we we if if you're not ready to buy today, take a look at us, learn more, reach out to our IR team, and uh, and and we have a really tremendous company with uh, a, a growing and incredible product line. So thanks, Tim, for having me on, and uh, I enjoyed myself. All right. You bet, man. Hold on a second. I'm going to shut this off. Hey there, all you stock market junkies. Thanks for tuning in to yet another executive interview here at Alpha Wolf Trading. Today we had John Allerwerther from Genius Brands International. Ticker symbol G-N-U-S. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And if you did, do us a favor. Give us a like. Why not give us a share? And while you're at it, how about giving us a follow? Until next time, stay safe. Alpha Wolf Training wishes you the very best of success.